Hey everybody, welcome back to SOC 302, Indigenous Mental Health and Healing Practices with the School of Counselling. To week nine, um, we're going this week to be pulling apart dance, healing and therapy to heal. Okay, so please make sure that your shoes are off during this lecture. Um, this week I would like to begin with the acknowledgement and state that ICON Institute of Australia proudly acknowledges the traditional owners of the Eora Nation, the Gadigal people where the Sydney campus resides. We recognise the important and ongoing place that all Indigenous people hold in our community, including our non-Indigenous community who support our environment, our people and our place. We pay Pay respects to the elders, both past and present, and commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding and respect for the benefit of the broader community and future generations. Okay, so um, bringing your attention here to the terminology review, remembering that we're using that throughout our assignments and also bringing your attention here to Uncle Paul Gordon's book, The Dreaming Path. And particularly this week's topic is um, learning to chapter eight, which is leading from page 147 to 159. So our learning intentions for today's topic is we're going to be learning about dance and ritual and that has been an essential part of the cultural and spiritual life of Indigenous peoples in this country for over 65,000 years and it's been used to promote health and well-being and also to share cultural knowledge. We are going to be looking at today about dance movement therapy, how it utilises dance and movement to assist in the integration of mind, body and spirit in a professional modality that was identified only in the mid 20th century. We're going to be looking at the parallels between these practices observed by dance movement therapists that include a holistic approach to wellness and priority on non-verbal communication achieved through shared rhythmic movement. And many of the significant challenges faced by our communities in contemporary Australia include transgenerational trauma, which has impacted positively on dance movement therapy interventions in other countries around the world. So, however, currently there is no documented evidence that this practice is being utilised in Australia. So we need a little bit more um, research done in the area of dance to heal. So let us respond to the issue in offering ideas to support dance movement therapists to be culturally competent and culturally safe, but also respectful in events to engage with Indigenous peoples of our nation. And recommendations include the development of genuine partners, partnerships and relationships that enable two-way learning. So to develop cultural safe programs that acknowledge and respect Indigenous ways of being, knowing and living. So let, what we're going to do now, we're going to have a little, little look at um, Indigenous creative arts history. And we know that um, culture um, is the oldest living culture on the entire planet and it, it expressed in an unbroken lineage for over 65,000 years. And before colonisation, 250 years ago, there were around 700 languages and deadly dialects used by 250 Indigenous nations to 500 nations which had their own territories and systems of law that should be spelled L-O-R-E. In traditional society, dance and ceremony were important in maintaining health, well-being and community connection as part of the complex whole of Indigenous society and that's according to Bayard in 1988. 
songs and dances were performed to connect with nature and spiritual um, different realms to teach and maintain cultural knowledge and pass that on. So dance movement and you can see that in the brackets for short. If you see this term, know that it means dance movement therapy. And that uses dance and movement with people all around the world for similar functions, including improving health and well-being in a holistic way, promoting community bonding and connection to culture and cultural vitality. And the modality has been used effectively with Indigenous and minority communities in dominant Western cultures and in other post-colonial nations to address challenges including acute, long-term and intergenerational trauma according to Gray, Harris, Dumby, Jordan and Elton. So while there are signs of positive development for Indigenous communities in Australia, such as the doubling of doctors and threefold increase of medical students from Indigenous backgrounds since 2004, we've experienced severe disadvantage in comparison with other cultural groups referred to, as the government calls it, a gap. Um, across diverse measures of health and well-being. And I've been exploring this in my um, job um, just recently and asked the question only yesterday, who is actually determining those social determinants of health in data? No one could answer. So Indigenous adults, for example, report psychological distress at around three times the rate of other Australians. And this is a result of the processes of colonisation and related policies from the government included forced eviction from land and often through extreme violence. And more recent damaging policies and practices have included assimilation and the removal from families and children who've been come to know as the stolen generations. And this is according to the Commonwealth of Australia, 1997. The negative impact of these practices have been significant, including a detrimental disconnection from language and culture and intergenerational trauma described as historical and is intergenerational knowing that it's in the cells and can be passed on down through three to six generations, but it's also cumulative. So this trauma is recognised as casual in styles and cycles of disadvantage, discrimination, poverty, incarceration and violence. The details and impact of this story are well documented through its origins and not stilly, still openly acknowledged in current political discourse. So useful texts around this topic include Judy Atkinson's Trauma Trails, Recreating Those Songlines and resources published by the Aboriginal Healing Foundation and also Closing the Gap Clearinghouse. And if you need to have a chat with um, about Closing the Gap, I'm available. I'm working on it at the moment um, and also um, looking at areas where um, that can be um, achieved but through Indigenous sovereignty. Despite an evident need, Indigenous communities continue to face the situation referred to as institutionalised racism, or you may have heard of it as systemic racism, whereby members are often underserved or served inappropriately by institutions and programs that do not match cultural holistic perspectives of health and therefore do not best meet our health needs. And again, going into the health department's data, um, we're looking that the government are determining those deficit models of data, which needs to be flipped to the strengths-based models of data that we govern. 
As described below, the potential affinity of dance movement therapy with Indigenous cultural practices and the previous successful application of dance movement therapy with wider communities experiences similar issues and indicates a possibility for dance movement therapy to be relevant and useful within all communities. And there is an identified need for cultural guidance for dance movement movement therapy, intending to work with our communities as there are few Australian dance movement therapists who have an Indigenous background and very few working with Indigenous populations and that needs to increase. So to support dance movement therapy, to develop confidence to offer um, that therapy to Indigenous peoples, the Dance Therapy Association of Australasia initiated a panel discussion about effective engagement with Indigenous communities at its 2015 conference. And author Dunfrey conveyed this discussion and authors Jordan and Searle shared their pertinent professional experiences. And the discussion catalyzed deeper thinking on the topic, which has been augmented by theory and research and developed into this chapter. And our writing was also informed by Searle's integral expertise as an Indigenous woman, Jordan's collaboration with Indigenous elders to develop a resource regarding intergenerational trauma in the local Indigenous community. And that was done through Larrakia Healing Group up near Darwin in 2016. And all authors' experiences working with the range of, of communities as dance therapists and in related roles outlined the detail in author biographies and basically stated that the benefits of dance therapy to heal um, is unbelievable. It's definitely um, gives out benefits to those outcomes rather than not hitting those outcomes. So how do we support um, therapists using dance in contemporary Indigenous communities. So I want you to take a look at this video here. This is a video of Bangara Dance Theatre and this video is called Artifact. So cultural practices including dance and other art forms in this country remain strong and vital and you you would have seen that in our culture everywhere we still dance today and traditional ceremonies including dance are still performed in urban and remote communities and those fusions of traditional and contemporary dance are presented by professional companies such as Bangara of the video that was just presented and community based groups like the popular Chucky dancers. Participation in traditional and contemporary dance forms contribute to those positive outcomes as just mentioned in the social determinants of health, including maintenance of traditional cultural knowledge and promotion of health messages. And I'm just going to bring your attention particularly to those traditional cultural knowledge and traditional dance. Um, that's where the highest outcomes are met for those social determinants of health using traditional traditional practice. So modern styles of dance include hip hop and they are enjoyed by all of us across the country. And we had a look um, at and pulled apart hip hop last week on the benefits of hip hop and why it's important for the social justice movement. Um, and again here, dance can be incorporated into that movement as well. So um, music therapy, according to Trashim in 2014 and art therapies to Judy Atkinson in 2002, state that dance 
dance and music are the connection for Indigenous peoples when delivered in a culturally appropriate way. So hopefully I've shown you so far um, the overview of the creative arts being music, dance, drama and um, visual, um, sorry, music, dance, drama and art um, and I've, we've pulled apart the dance and the music and um, the drama now. Next week's going to be the visual arts, but they all connect to each other, to that holistic view of healing. So in Atkinson's review, um, it found no published documentation of dance movement therapy in Indigenous communities, although this potential was identified by dance movement therapists. However, there is much recommendation for modalities like dance movement therapy for the treatment of trauma or trauma-informed care in Indigenous contexts. And this includes exper expressive therapies, according to the Blue Knot Foundation, creative and symbolic therapeutic approaches, according to Atkinson, and body-based approaches, according to Perry and Hambrick and the other um, references shown below, including the Australian Childhood Foundation. So I want you to consider the potential of dance movement therapy based on work with people in other cultural settings who've experienced high levels of trauma and briefly examined literature about the applications of dance movement therapy in these settings. So the potential for dance movement therapy to offer restorative support after traumatic experiences is supported by research that identifies the importance of working with non-verbal or pre-verbal and somatic events and elements of trauma in developmentally ordered approach. And the, ex the effective use of dance movement therapy applied cross-culturally to address suffering after trauma is described, particularly in the um, literature, by authors Gray and Harris. Dumfrey, Elton and Jordan also reported positive responses to a pilot program of dance movement therapy from Indigenous peoples recovering from colonisation and conflict in Timor. So high interest and acceptance of dance movement therapy as a suitable healing modality was reported in that study alongside indications of improved well-being for participants and that is our goal. A solid body of literature by Indigenous professionals and researchers supports development of programs for Indigenous mental health and wellbeing that are culturally relevant and therefore contribute most effectively. In working together, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mental health and wellbeing principles and practice by Michelle Dungeon offers a com comprehensive overview and refers to a set of recommended principles for engaging with and working towards healing for Indigenous individuals, families and also in communities. These can be summarised as, number one, the Aboriginal concept of health is spiritual and holistic. Number two, self-determination is central to the provision of Aboriginal services. Three, culturally valid understanding must shape provision of Aboriginal services and health, in, in particular mental health. Number four, the experience of trauma and loss are a direct outcome of the disruption to cultural well-being. So trauma and loss of this magnitude continues to have intergenerational effects. And number five, the human rights of Aboriginal peoples must be recognised and respected. Number six, racism, stigma, adversity and social disadvantage constitute ongoing stresses and have negative impacts on mental health and well-being. Number seven, 
The centrality of Aboriginal family and kinship systems must be understood and accepted, as well as the bonds of reciprocal affection, responsibility and sharing. Number eight, there is no single Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander culture or group, but numerous groupings, numerous deadly dialects and languages, kinship systems and tribes within nations, as well as ways of living. There's no blanket term. Number nine, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have great strengths, creativity and endurance and a deep understanding of the relationships between human beings and the environment. So these holistic and integrated understandings of health discussed previously are articulated in this following definition. I invite you to close your eyes if you'd like to think about this deeper. Aboriginal health does not mean the physical well-being of an individual, but refers to the social, emotional and cultural well-being of the whole community. For Aboriginal people, this is seen in terms of the whole life view. Healthcare services should strive to achieve the state where every individual is able to achieve their full potential as human beings and must bring about the well-being of their communities. G. Dungeon, Schultz, Hart and Kelly back in 2014 identifies seven domains of social and emotional well-being that are important to Indigenous peoples, including con connection to spirituality and ancestors, physical well-being, mental well-being, family kinship well-being, community well-being, culture and land and loss or disruption of harmony between any or one of those domains is considered to result in negative health. Indigenous psychiatric Milroy, I'm sorry, sorry, psychiatrist Milroy back in 2006 identifies risk and protective factors that are useful to consider in developing culturally appropriate programs with the formation including the impacts of colonisation, disadvantage and discrimination, while in the latter comprise country, community and cultural connectedness. Cultural safety can be defined as an environment which is safe for people, where there is no assault, challenge or denial of anybody's identity or who they are and what they need. It is about a shared respect, a shared meaning, a shared knowledge and a shared experience of learning together. Some parallels can be considered here between these ideas of holistic health and the person as a member of the wider ecosystem and practices of dance movement therapy that recognise the significance of body and mind as interconnected elements of a person, thus bringing in the Western biomodical of health with the Indigenous um, model of, excuse me, of healing. So the practice of being fully present in the moment with clients, according to Lewis, and attuning to those six senses may have some affinity with the practice of deep listening applied in Dadiri. So what are the ways forward for dance movement therapists and what are those suggestions for supporting successful engagement? So the following section is going to introduce you to some suggestions that are informed by the resources for dance movement therapists who might wish to make their services available and appropriate to Indigenous communities. And this could be an area where you may like to go and study later to specialise in any of these creative arts areas. The discussion focuses on the process of becoming informed and establishing 
genuine collaborative relationships and we're only talking about this yesterday with information and data it needs to be authentic um, and genuine it can't be um, anything but otherwise um, within the future it's not going to make sense and there will be gaps so while most of these suggestions are relevant across the provisions and sorry professions and for therapists thinking about working with other cultural groups in this case the ideas are directed towards our own dance movement therapy peers specifically in relation to indigenous australian australian people okay so when we are talking about dance movement therapy, okay, I have a question that I want you to answer on the discussion board right now. Do you think Indigenous communities are disconnected or do you think that the government and the system is disconnected to mental health? And I'm just going to get you to answer that for me on the discussion board. Okay, so when we're looking at developing cultural awareness or you may know it as cultural competence, it was a term that was used um, a few years back, therapists need to develop awareness and understanding of Indigenous history and that's done through education which we have not received. Through done through politics within the government and then also done through disadvantage to work in a culturally competent way with communities. And we, rec we recommend that therapists investigate that history, particularly the histories of that intergenerational trauma and how it is actually affecting the body. So then you're integrating that with that Western biomedical um, biomedical. Um, method of health and current realities of life for Indigenous peoples specific to communities where they are engaged with. So it is equally important for non-Indigenous professionals to reflect on our own culture, history and position of privilege within society. You know, you hear a lot of people talking about how Aboriginal people have what's called so-called privileges within society, but let me flip that back on to the unconscious bias, okay? Is it because the system has conditioned people to think that they're privileged in this Western society and they're scared of losing those privileges? I'll leave that there. Informing ourselves about the ongoing poor human rights record of the whole country and I'm going to bring your attention to here I've mentioned it before we have discussed it Australia does not have a Bill of Rights for anybody written in law and legislation so that means that the government has not recognized the UN's um, Convention of Human Rights legally within the system and that needs to change not just for um, indigenous peoples in this country for everybody and this is another task that may assist us to appreciate difficulties that our clients may face. So it is important to show respect and to follow protocols of our clients' communities. And as discussed in Principle 8, it is also vital for therapists to be mindful of diversity between individuals and families within any community. And this includes generational differences and differences between people living on country or in Indigenous communities and families within any community. So it can take some time to figure out who our partners or cultural navigators might be as we slowly get to know a community. So where possible, as an initial step, a therapist should work with and seek cultural supervision from an Indigenous co-worker, an Aboriginal liaison officer, an Aboriginal clinician or preferably a team of advisors. And that can be formal or informal. 
And um, it funding allows, it is highly valuable to employ an Indigenous co-worker either in a mainstream position or an Indigenous specific position as we discuss here. So prior to facilitating a workshop at a healing retreat for Indigenous people with chronic illness, I liaised with the retreat quarter coordinator on the physical, cultural and spiritual needs of the group and the demographics, including the gender of participants. We discussed that the coordinator thought would be in helpful using dance movement activities. And we also discussed existing factions between participants and how to man manage those sessions. And a sim similar consultive process occurred with um, a a cultural worker okay so basically that saying don't be afraid to ring up um, a dance therapist who is indigenous invite them into your practice and making sure that you pay them um, what they're worth for that knowledge Okay, so taking the other perspective, two-way learning also implies that therapists also have something to share and to learn. So we recommend generosity in the sharing of therapists' own skills and knowledge and openness to the co-creation of new ideas and possibilities with Indigenous advisors and clients. In a two-way sharing, learning and deep listening environment, everybody learns. So therapists should not be too apprehensive or fearful about doing the wrong thing. And it's just like in drama, there is no right or wrong thing to do. If a relationship of trust has been developed with cultural navigators or advisors, they can indicate when a mistake has been made. So being trauma-informed is therapeutic work with Indigenous individuals, families and all communities that may very often be in the context of trauma or intergenerational trauma and great loss, remembering grief and loss. This is the area we're talking about. So therefore, it is important for therapists to be knowledgeable about the history and dynamics of trauma within and between generations and ways to work with complex trauma symptoms, particularly from an Indigenous perspective. And therapists need to be aware of the potential ongoing stresses and triggers faced by clients, for example, personal and institutional racism, where a daily experience is ha like does happen for many Indigenous peoples, including myself. So considerations for practice. It is most important in all cultural cross-cultural interactions, notably between non-Indigenous and Indigenous Australians, that clients be treated and acknowledged with respect and dignity as fellow human beings. This means our that means being ourselves and allowing our clients to be themselves, and that includes yourself. This is often missing for Indigenous Australians in their interactions with non-Aboriginal people. Okay, so let me now break down self-determination in therapy. So our role as therapists at all stages of the engagement and therapeutic process is to facilitate empowerment or self-determination in, in any movement. This means that our clients' collaborators should feel that they have their own sense of control and autonomy and that their voices are being clearly heard and respected throughout all stages of the program development. And we can do this by working in a genuinely collaborative manner and through development of trusting and long-lasting relationships. And as suggested, the cultural relevance of our programs will be enhanced when we, with complementary skills, are given the opportunity to be involved in those programs and to actually share leading those programs as well. It also hits the highest outcomes when we develop a safe environment. 
The primary goal for most trauma healing frameworks is the creation of a sense of safety and control for clients. And for Indigenous peoples, this includes ensuring cultural safety as described above in all aspects of program delivery. And we have found choice of location to be very important consideration for many um, of us because of the politics and trauma triggering often associated with particular organisations. It is good if possible for therapists to find impartial locations or locations outside. We need to look at the recognition of Aboriginal strengths rather than the deficit model that is always provided. Data has been used to blame us, been used against us, been used um, for us to be used in a particular narrative model and that needs to change. As therapists, we need to move beyond the engagement phase and begin to consider trialling programs within communities. It is important to employ a strengths-based approach. Therapists should locate and build on those resources that sustain and inspire individuals and communities. And these are often culturally referenced. So, for example, activities and programs that encourage and facilitate connections to land and ideally traditional lands are highly recommended. So we also recommend that therapists consider the choice of music. So this is your connection to music therapy, particularly with care and consultation in a spirit of two-way learning. Okay, and this is an example. So in a workshop I led at a healing retreat, I used a variety of music, some contemporary Indigenous and mainstream music that I thought members might relate to and enjoy. In keeping with dance music practice of being being flexible in the moment and with the program plan I repeated a particular song or music piece as members expressed an affinity with or an enjoyment of these. In one project in a remote community the best success I had was with a group of hard to engage girls occurred through a series of video exchanges with African refugee girls in Darwin learning each other's dances then adding on their own cultural including model and traditional flavour. I could feel the energy in the group synchronising when they shared their traditional dance and also individual characters um, were thrown forward to cheers and laughter and the joy and pride in the room was priceless. So we suggest that therapists use a holistic and non-verbal approach and it may be complementary to Indigenous ways of communication and holistic concepts of healing. Therapy is also evidence as approach that is effective for responding to trauma similarly to those that have experienced by many Indigenous peoples. And dance may be useful experience in this context due to its potential to incorporate traditional as well as contemporary dance movements and rituals to enhance mental health and well-being. So the tasks here. Um, I am uh, here for you to do. I hope that you enjoy the facilitated session today. Don't forget to record this session. I will be marking that based on the recording and I will be back next week. Okay, so the task this week is we're going to be looking at dance um, for Australian and other contemporary Indigenous communities. The importance of dance and other art forms for health and healing is well recognised. So, for example, the most promising Indigenous healing interventions in Canada are reported of the, as those that include cultural activities with traditional healing practices. Aboriginal healing practices are noted as effective by trauma expert Perry because of their use of movement that is repetitive, rhythmic, relevant and relational respectful and rewarding and the use of rhythmic movement is also central to dance therapy and is used for like-minded purposes 
Okay, so here's a dance video here that I want you to take a look at. And I want you to then answer these questions um, and put them on the discussion board. The first question asks you, what are the five emotional mental benefits of dance? The second question is, what is it about dance that so easily prompts movement and joy in all of us? And number three, how is dance connected to brain development in trauma? You know, looking at that neuroscience activity when we dance. I want you to brainstorm, research and answer the above questions using a summarised response in your words. Okay, so above all, however, Boas stresses the importance of us therapists relaxing all of our ideas and what we've learnt and unlearned those and have a look at those theories about clients in order that they give full attention to the here and now of the myriad diversity between us and within us. Gray and Boas also speak about the importance of therapists developing genuine compassion and capacity to accommodate drastically differing worldviews and allow notions of us and them of us and them to dissolve. So getting rid of that segregation, that division. Okay, so the second activity to today I want you to do is a research study and I want you to go and have a look at some research to answer these questions and again um, put, post them up on the, um, on the discussion board. So the first one says, how does dance relieve stress? And it's got let us do an experiment. So I'm going to get you to go ahead and I want you to make a playlist Okay, of a few upbeat dance songs, I want to li I want you to listen to your own playlist, and I want you to actually get up, jump up, jump up and down, and dance, and dance in your seat if you don't feel like getting up. But the whole purpose of dance is to move, so you need to get up and move. And I want you to move your whole body, um, and feel the music. So. In other words, you don't know, need to know how to dance, okay? You simply need to move. And if you like me, you just need to jump up and down with random movements and reflect on your findings after your experiment of your dance experiment using what you've learnt thus far. And I want you to um, go and do a little bit of research, okay, about it. And then I want you to reflect on that activity, that experience, and I want you to post that reflection. And even if you, even if you want to do just dance, which is what we used in schools as well, you can. Um, and then I want you to post about how it made you feel. And okay, the last one here is what are the three main purposes of dance therapy? in your eyes what are they and why are they important and all the references here are available for you um, on this page and um, yeah I'm going to finish up here okay I'm going to finish up here with a quick um, little reflection from when we began um, the, the course and I'm just going to tell you the most important activity culturally for us is the creative arts. That includes those four umbrellas, music, dance, drama and art, regardless of anything else that comes in here. If you want to highlight the healing for mob and hit those highest outcomes, we need to do that in traditional practice. Okay, so thank you very much, everybody. I've just finished marking your podcast this morning. Um, hopefully you will get your marks back soon. Um, well done to everybody for doing such a great job. And um, thank you so much. And I will see you next week. Wallawani Digimon.